Welcome, Earthlings, non-Earthlings, ridiculous ones, and soon-to-be ridiculous ones. You are right on time for your ridiculous hour with Joseph Zinner. I appreciate you tuning in. Today, I'm very honored to have our special guest, Dr. Joshua Plant, one of my heroes and mentors in the nutritional field. How are you, Joshua? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on this call, Joe, uh, or Hangout, I guess. This is my first time ever in a Hangout, uh, not being too popular in high school. It's, uh, I'm I'm proud to be in a hangout finally. <laughs> never too late. Never too late to be cool. Um, yeah, I was nerdy when nerdy wasn't cool. I think you – it sounds like you were too. A nerdy's become kind of cool. Yeah, and, and now all of a sudden I'm not – and now all of a sudden I'm not nerdy. So I always seem to be on the wrong end of the spectrum. Yeah, you got cool. You got all muscular and stuff. You know, what can you do? Um, great. So I wanted to bring – you on the show because uh, one of the things I pride myself in is never believing that I know too much or know stuff. I used to work as a chemical engineer in the refineries, and what I uh, excelled at was knowing that there was always someone smarter than me in any field uh, I wanted to look into. And so when I started looking into nutrition, you know, I found people like David Wolf and Mike Adams and whatnot. And when I study nutritional companies, um, like when I studied ZJ International to decide whether I wanted to be a part of it, I studied you specifically. I, uh, I really dug into research and I like researching researchers. And I found that the way you research is to look at things with a brand new set of eyes. So can you talk a little bit about how you came to the essential oil space? Because it seems to me like you took everything everyone else had done and said, oh, that's great. Now let me throw that away and start over. <laughs> yeah, uh, a, a little bit, right? That 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 kind of summarizes a lot. This, um, so my background is very much traditional scientist. Uh, got my undergraduates in uh, biology and chemistry. Got uh, an NIH fellowship uh, where I did cancer research. Was then uh, uh, recruited by Harvard Medical School, where I was able to graduate with a PhD in biomedical sciences. I uh, did postdoctoral fellowships at cancer institutes. A very traditional. Uh, approach uh, when becoming a scientist. Um, and then so when I finished, I, I wanted to, to, as you kind of said, to look at everything and then I kind of threw it away. And I looked at ultimately the influence that uh, we are having as a community as a whole in overcoming a lot of the problems that we're facing. And we're all attacking them the same way. And uh, to me, that seems to be a little bit of an uh, insane approach to overcoming the many of the challenges we're facing. Uh, and so I kind of looked at, at the greatest way we could ultimately make an influence, uh, a huge influence across the globe, uh, was really through it, teaching people to eat right, teaching people to exercise, and utilizing natural supplementation. If we are able to educate individuals on those three components, I firmly believe that we could accomplish more in a short amount of time, creating a health and wellness uh, revival or revolution, if you will, in that short amount of time, we would be able to do more than, than us continually to beat our heads against the research and development tables of which traditional science is, is looking at. Uh, but I'm using a lot of those tools that I developed as a scientist, uh, using state-of-the-art uh, bioinformatics, using state-of-the-art type instrumentation to understand what properties nature has. Uh, and so I am, I'm a firm believer in, in merging the worlds of modern science and natural healing. And uh, I believe when that happens, solutions are found. Nice. And so what took you specifically to the essential oils? Though? Because, you know, when I started studying nutrition, I was studying superfoods and this and that. And people kept telling me about essential oils. People that cared about me kept saying, dude, you got to look at this. And I was like, yeah, I get it. You know, aromatherapy, lavender in a bathtub. I get aromatherapy has got to be great. You get rid of stress, anxiety. It's going to help health. I get that. That's different. And then when I actually looked at essential, oils, I was like, holy cow, this is, this is it. Like, this is God's chemistry kit. I had been looking for. Did you have a similar awakening to essential oils, or did you always get it? Yeah. Well, so scientists were kind of exposed to essential oils early on, right? Uh, essential oils are used frequently uh, in the pharmaceutical world and in many other avenues, uh, right? So, for example, Ben Gay, uh, which has been used for decades and decades, uh, or muscle rubs, I guess, used for decades and decades, uh, utilizes methyl salicylate. That is found in the wintergreen botanical. That's where it was initially discovered. Benzyl benzoate is readily used uh, as a prescription 
uh, with respect to like lice and these types of things, uh, uh, pest infestation on the body. Uh, that's found in uh, ylang, ylang And so we see ultimately that scientists have been utilizing essential oils or the properties or the constituents that are found in essential oils for uh, decades uh, upon decades. And so understanding, I, and I like the way you kind of si uh, summarize it, it is, it is God's chemistry slash medicinal kit, right? This is ultimately an essential oil is able to take the, the essence of that botanical uh, and concentrate that essence out to where you are able to get an efficacious amount to, with respect to helping you reach your health and wellness goals um, uh, that otherwise would not have been there. And so essential oils, the, the power of essential oils have been known for decades. Uh, that's why we see over 13,000 articles published on PubMed talking about essential oils is because there is so much scientific evidence that they legitimately work and help individuals and overcome many problems that we're facing. Uh, that I absolutely came in and wanted to take the essential oil level to a, a, a new height uh, by incorporating science into that. And that is uh, that is an area I believe has been largely neglected in the essential oil space is science. Nice. And so, you know, one of the things that I loved about essential oils, once I got knee deep or neck deep, I should say, I dove in, um, I was big on connecting body, mind, and soul, you know, in terms of the connections between what we're thinking and the, just the, how everything fits together. And, and there was so many things that made sense, like wintergreen is one of the main um, anti-inflammatories. And wintergreen on the emotional healing side, if you follow a book by a guy named um, uh, David McDonald, Doug, uh, anyways, not Mr. McDonald, whatever his name is, on the emotional healing side, wintergreen is the oil of surrender. You know, and so it made a lot of sense to me that an anti-inflammatory would be the oil of surrender. Have you ever gotten into looking at, you know, the emotional side? You know, there's a great book called Emotions of, or Molecules of Emotion. Have you looked into how the, the oils affect emotions and how that plays in, how that all connects? Uh, so I personally have not, right? But you see several uh, studies that have looked at this, right? So there's many individuals that look at the power for example, of lavender, the power of ylang, ylang <clears throat> excuse me, uh, connecting individuals, right? When we look at the olfactory response, that is uh, one of the more emotional connecting responses or sensories uh, to our emotional systems that we have. It actually exceeds that of touch and in many ways sight and hearing uh, to where an individual can have a much more emotional response by smelling maybe their late wife's clothes than they would by looking at a picture of her. It, 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 prom it promotes a very intimate uh, emotional uh, uh, connection. Uh, and so you can imagine the power of essential oils that are having. Uh, so for example, uh, some of the essential oils that uh, are common where you grew up, by ultimately distilling those in your rooms, a lot of people will have a very emotional reaction, almost a type of therapeutic reaction, listening or diffusing those essential oils with botanicals that they had as a child. Um, I know a lot of uh, psychologists kind of do that to open up uh, the emotional uh, connectivity they had as a child, these types of uh, being able to, to open up that gateway that was otherwise be closed. Yeah, and I think, um, at least for myself, intuitively, I, I thought, or I, I, in the past, I thought that, well, obviously, drinking the oil has got to be the strongest way to get it in your body, right? And then secondary would be put it on your skin because that's, that's you know, still touching, but it's not getting it inside your body necessarily as quickly. And then smelling is probably in third place. And the more I got into oils, this is not it at all, especially if you're dealing with something in the mind. The, the inhaling it or, you know, taking it in aromatically can be the most powerful. Can you speak to that? Like why? I know it has to do with the amygdala, but can you speak to the science of why breathing it in may be more powerful? than the other, you know, than the other avenues. Absolutely, so when we look ultimately, when we are inhaling something, there's actually uh, receptors uh, on our nasal passageway, right? So when we smell something, we are actually uh, assuming those molecules into those receptors on our nose. So it is, an, uh, it is a, a legitimate way of consuming uh, a product. Uh, and so, Obviously, as you can imagine, those receptors that are on the nose work then through what's called the olfactory response. And so what you're able to do is you have one molecule, you're able to send that molecule through numerous different channels. Through consumption, you're sending it through a completely different channel as if you were going to apply it to your skin or as if you were going to inhale it. And so that way you can see, imagine, 
how lavender can have a completely different effect with respect to applying it to your skin, the wonderful properties it has with, with skin, same with frankincense, uh, versus inhaling lavender, which has a completely unique aspect in of itself. And so by the, the different channels in which we are able to consume essential oils, topically, aromatically, or uh, through uh, oral consumption, you can actually get three different ways in which your body responds to that. You know, either by stimulating certain uh, uh, stimuli in the intestinal tract, uh, or through the topical uh, absorption, or through the olfactory response. And it's, it's kind of a way of allowing a single molecule to have multiple avenues of impact on your body. Nice. Yeah, I love the way you put that. And, and the way I look at it, it's like, now that I understand it, it's like going straight into the amygdala with a molecule that's going to affect your brain immediately is much better than putting something into your body that's going to, you know, consuming it where it's going to go into the acid reactor we call a stomach or putting it into your skin. It's going to go into the blood. The blood has its own filters. Yeah. Um, so, what you know, obviously there's a lot of debate about um, consuming oils. Um, and I just want to mention because I, I don't know who's going to watch this video, and I want to mention that it, we are talking about consuming oils. This is not all oils. We don't want you to just consume any essential oils you have at home. This is consumable oils we're talking about. And the oils with the mayo are clinical grade, so it's just another step up from any oils I've seen, I've studied. This is just – so can you talk to why, you know, how and why a mayo is clinical and, and how that's – important to know. I mean, a lot of people go to a health food store and think that they're getting good oils. And to me, I'm going to put myself out there and say this, there's a lot of great oils at health food stores and there's a lot of really not great oils at health food stores. You can't trust an oil because it's at a health food store. Absolutely. So uh, let me answer that first question with respect to clinical grade. Um, when we say we have clinical oils, what we mean by that is we actually have taken a, a standard that is often used in clinical studies. And we kind of say, okay, here is an oil that was utilized in clinical studies. Let's use that as our unwavering standard of how lavender should work. Because lavender, it's going to differ widely based upon the season, the location, the geography, the number of distillations. Infinite variables can ultimately affect the type of chemical constituents that make up that particular lavender essential oil. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, okay, let's set a standard. Uh, this is what lavender oil should look like. Rather than having somebody's opinion ultimately dictate which way it goes, we wanted to use that which has been ultimately vetted by the scientific community as a whole. So we bring that in and we are then able to ultimately then align our essential oils to those that have been used in those studies, giving us an unwavering standard of essential oils, whether it be lavender, frankincense, or whatever it may be. Uh, and so we have partnerships with biotech companies that we are able to get those oils that are used in those, uh, many of those clinical studies. Um, and so that, is, that gives us that, that confidence that when individuals source or buy their oils from us, they're able to get that exceptionally high level of quality. Now, we have taken oils from all over, health food stores, wherever it may be, and we have analyzed them and we see just how different each of these oils are. In fact, not too long ago, I, well, actually just uh, three days ago, I took five individuals that were lucky enough to be part of a, a raffle, and I took them into the biotech lab that I work in. And they themselves were able to do the experiments and see for themselves, based upon grabbing a couple of different oils, how much they actually differ. Uh, and uh, they, even though they're all called lemon, uh, those three lemons all had drastic different chemical properties. Yeah, absolutely. And when I first got started in this area of playing around with essential oils, I would tell people things like, well, you know, if you have old, old oils that are, are not consumable or not, uh, you, know, you know, not highest grade consumable oils, you can still probably use them to diffuse and stuff. You just don't want to take them internally. But now using the same logic that we just spoke about earlier, now I say, you know what, if you have those oils, give them to somebody you don't like that much or something like this. <laughs> just don't use them. You know, maybe use them in the, in the barn to get rid of the spiders or something. Yeah. But, but don't use them in your house or around your, your kids if they're not completely. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and in many ways, inhalation is actually a more sensitive response, right? Yeah. We don't have those buffers. We don't have the acidity yeah. of the stomach that can in any ways kind of be a protective barrier. Um, and so inhalation is probably one of the more sensitive ways. It's a, it's a direct olfactory response that we're having. Excellent. And so where do you, uh, where do you see 
the future of essential oils going? Because I feel very powerful right now asking you this because I think you personally will have a huge impact on where the future of essential oils go. Uh, you know, that raises a very good question. And this is what excites me so much as a scientist is what gets me up each day is not what I know, it's what I don't know. Um, and I, uh, uh, looking always at the forefront, we just conducted a huge study looking at telomeres, right? This is just recently put in one of the books that I, I wrote, where we look ultimately how essential oils are impacting telomeres. Telomeres are the protective end of the DNA. As we age, those telomeres get shorter. That has been a direct link. And we did a huge study where we were able to look at the impact of essential oils have on our telomere length, both by delaying the shortening as well as increasing the length. And this is a wonderful study where we're going to be publishing that very soon. We just did a study uh, looking at the impact uh, that essential oils have with respect to uh, um, uh, uh, overcoming, you know, the uh, what's the purification properties of essential oils in comparing them to other common purification uh, compounds. Uh, we just published that in scientific journals. And so I think ultimately when we look at the power of essential oils, and I'm going to broaden that, when we look at the power of natural supplementation, I believe wholeheartedly we have touched just the tip of the iceberg. You know, some of the most powerful drugs that are used today in saving people's lives were initially identified uh, in nature. For example, Taxol uh, is the most widely used chemotherapy drug out there. It was initially discovered in the bark of the California yew tree. And so I believe continually as we dive in deeper with our biotech collaborations, with our university partnerships, with our own research labs, that we are going to always be on the forefront of advancing human medicine. Nice. So let me see if I can uh, transition this because I know we're, we're starting to run out of time, but um, can't have a call with you or hang out with you without talking about Moringa. And so since we've been talking about essential oils, let's yeah, So I can get my drink, my, get my fix for the day, actually, right now. <laughs> Don't have the um, So um, one of the best essential oils for um, anti-aging is the Moringa oil. I can say that, right? Aging is not a diagnosis. That's a fair statement to make, right? Um, am I clear in saying that? Yeah, I think, I think we're all right. We can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about aging. And, and so Moringa oil, I'll let you discuss this. So why is Moringa oil not the greatest to consume? And, and why, do, why do you choose to, or our company, why do we choose to put those in the facial lines? And, and how, does that, how did that decision come? Because I've heard, and this is one thing I want to ask you directly, I've heard that the Moringa oil is too detoxifying to take internally. And so to someone like me, I'm like, is that a challenge? Like I'm a detoxer, baby. I love toxic cleansing. Is that a challenge? I'm not. I haven't taken it internally, and I'm not certainly not recommending that. But but how did y'all come to that decision? So uh, we we recommend to take it topically uh, for numerous aspects, um, but uh, mainly just because the the uh, abundance of studies in it. We always want to make sure that which we're releasing has been studied extensively. Uh, that we're releasing safe products. Uh, Moringa oil has been used for thousands of years, but it's been used thousands of years primarily topically. A um, recent study has suggested that Moringa oil is significantly more hydrating than shea butter. Right, this is absolute, shea butter has been the gold standard, the bee's knees of hydrating the skin for decades. And we just recently showed significantly higher hydrating properties of Moringa oil when compared to shea butter. And so that's why we leverage that Moringa oil with its ability to ultimately hydrate the skin, uh, the wonderful uh, anti-aging properties that it has by hydrating and ultimately you are enriched in what are called phospholipids. Phospholipids are these molecules that surround and protect our cells. They are the the fortress wall, if you will, of our cell. And so the, the phospholipids, uh, our body's not able to really make on its own and we need to, we need to absorb them uh, to get them, uh, absorb them or consume them. And what uh, Moringa has, Moringa oil, is very unique phospholipid profile that you're able to get all of those types of phospholipids to protect your cells, rejuvenate your cells more efficiently. So it's a very powerful product with respect to a skincare line. Nice. And, and I, I'm going to assume that a shaving cream is coming, but until then, um, pure aloe vera, and by the way, aloe vera is clear. If you see that green aloe vera in the store, it's got dye in it. Pure aloe vera with moringa oil in it, shaving cream, money. It's so great. Uh, <laughs> I like the way you work.
I'm a, I'm a product creator. I like mixing stuff too, mixologist. So, um, but so let's let's talk about moringa on the whole. Like, because we talked about the moringa oil to to you know bring it in from the essential oil side, but but moringa powders that uh, this this company puts together is just it's incredible stuff. Um, the feedback I'm getting from my clients and friends is just amazing. I, it's it's wild to me that a lot of nutrition uh, nutritionists and dietitians and Doctors that get it haven't heard of this plant yet. How and, and a lot of people say, "Oh, it's the pharmaceutical industry trying to." I don't, I don't think it's that. I mean, they yeah, they can't make a profit off it, just like they can't make a profit off of lavender. So they have no benefit to spreading the word on it. But but why hasn't the word been spread better naturally? Is it just is it uh, just a secret yeah. that was read we weren't ready for until now? So it's actually widely consumed in several cultures, right? right? India, Malaysia, and so forth. It's been a staple in their diets for thousands of years. Um, as ancient times, it's, it's kind of um, uh, the properties, the health and wellness properties of Moringa have been utilized. And this is one of the, I think, the most convincing elements of the nutritional and health and wellness properties of Moringa. Uh, you see it has uh, spontaneously or independently come up in about seven different uh, population groups that were isolated from each other. And for thousands of years, each of these independent groups have ultimately discovered for themselves Moringa oleifera and its wonderful properties with respect to health and wellness. And so it hasn't one person discovered it and propagated it. It's, it's come up independently in about seven to ten different cultures. In fact, Moringa's got about 70 different names because it's been so widely consumed. Uh, for thousands of years for its health and wellness properties. Now, when we look inside the states, why haven't we not seen it here? Well, one is because what ultimately determines what uh, Western civilization consumes is largely determined by our palate. You know, we'd like to think we eat healthy and that we will make all the right food choices, but nonetheless, McDonald's revenue continues to climb, right? Um, often, we succumb uh, to our palate more than we do to we know what's good for us. Uh, and so when nutritionists and these types of individuals are working with, a lot of times they are bound to work with only that which they have ultimately learned about. And uh, they uh, only have learned about certain things that have been uh, propagated to them in medical school. So for example, when I was studying, we would have individuals that would come and talk to us about certain drugs. Now obviously these were drug reps for those particular companies and so we were not those were the only ones that we were exposed to. And so we see that the gradual evolution of incorporating natural products into our daily lives, it's, it's a very much an uphill battle, uh, but it's a, it's a battle that is definitely taking root. I was just selected uh, to write a chapter in a textbook that is going to be propagated in medical schools uh, about natural remedies. Uh, and we see that ultimately we can start to educate um, those that are are working with respect to our health and wellness, we can see the power and the influence that has on people. Nice, yeah, it's beautiful. And and just a quick story, one of the, the guys on our team is from Malaysia and, and he said he'd never heard of it. And I said, well, let's look it up and uh, see what it means, You know, see what the word is in Malaysian. And sure enough, he was like, oh yeah, I know that stuff. People use that before they go on dates. You know, He was like, <laughs> it's like a romance enhancement. He's like, I know that stuff. Well, he got all excited about it. So. So yeah, yeah it's, inter it's interesting that, that people in other cultures have been around this plant for longer. And I think to what, for whatever reason, the United States wasn't ready until now. And hey, we're ready now. And that's why, you know, for me, it's so, it was so important for me to get it involved. When I gave up engineering, I really wanted to be involved in something important and to be a, a part of the Moringa movement, um, just spreading the word about Moringa. I had been spreading the word about Moringa for five or six years. I'd been growing it in my backyard. I knew about it well. And before I, Zach Nasser introduced me to this company, I had been studying this plant. Like, why, guys, like they say, would you do this for free? Like, I was already spreading the word about Moringa. <laughs> I was already spreading the documentary all around. So I know I'm on my passion. I know I'm on the right path. And I'll, I'll tell you, Dr. Plant, to, to have you as our leader of this, one of the leaders of this Moringa movement is really powerful because I know that we're gonna stay on the cutting edge of science and stay ahead of the curve. So it's yeah. really an honor to have you, you know, leading this charge. So I wanna, I wanna take this into, is there anything else you wanted to say about Moringa before we move a little bit onto uh, your Well, other I guess, you know, one thing that we kind of talked about, it, it, it is the most nutritiously potent botanical on earth. And a lot of times, I'm very hesitant to use superlatives. <clears throat> but it's been one of the most widely studied botanicals solely because of its nutritional density in which it yields. 
And so this botanical has an amazing ability to deliver a, a powerful uh, amount of nutrition if, if properly manufactured, utilized, and incorporated. And so it's a wonderful botanical that uh, I've absolutely admired similar to yourself for years. And so being able to be part of this to, uh, great revolution of helping individuals ultimately better their health and wellness is, uh, is, a great, uh, is a great privilege. And so thank you. Indeed. Indeed. And so, and before we move on from Moringa, because I do want to get into your book, I want to get into a little bit of a preview about what the movie that's coming is. I, I really don't know much about that. Um, but so, Moringa has 36 anti-inflammatories. I've heard that the next highest plant is 22. Maybe you can confirm if that's true. Um, but can you speak a little bit about the importance of removing inflammation and how, you know, I've heard many times that what's in the way of the body's healing is inflammation. So, can you speak about the importance of the anti-inflammatories and the fact that 36 of them were put together, creator, God, whichever one you prefer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, what I'll do is I, I guess I can speak on the diversity, right, the importance of this. Right? Yes. When, when people speak of inflammation, un unfortunately, that word has become adulterated and has assumed many things where it has taken a, a very broad spectrum. Um, and what I'll do is I'll kind of speak a little bit on the molecular pathways in which ultimately a lot of the uh, things happen. So there's a thing called TNF-alpha. It's a gene that is responsible for a lot of uh, a type of um, uh, inflammation you see, for example, if you're kicked and you get bruising occurring in that area. Uh, TNF-alpha is a type of gene that is expressed that uh, way. Uh, well, several studies have shown that Moringa actually just down-regulates that uh, TNF-alpha gene. Uh, and so you're able to uh, look at the impact that that may have. Now, ultimately, a lot of people will see the diversity of those anti-inflammatories. What that really means is there's so many different chemical pathways or biomedical pathways, cellular pathways that can lead to those problems, that it's not necessarily, as you mentioned before, the amount of anti-inflammatories, but the diversity, right? Having 36 of them to where you're able to combat so many different pathways simultaneously, it allows individuals to have a complete system uh, overhaul, if you will, with respect to those powerful properties that it yields. Yeah. And the way I see it is like when inflammation inflames, so you're going to block function in the body. You know, inflammation means things are swelling up. So you're blocking the, the body's natural ability to function, you know, to do yeah. things. So you, 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 you reduce that swelling or that inflammation. And obviously the body, you know, the, these plants are great and they have all the things the body desires, but the body is what's doing the healing. I think we all know that or most of us know yeah. that. So, you it's know, just we're just giving the body, we're giving the body what it needs. Say, I always say our body is the best doctor out there. And it's important that we just give that doctor the scalpel and tools that it needs to heal itself. And those Amen. components are largely nutrition, right? And so let's give our body the nutrition it needs so that it can effectively do what it needs to do. Amen to that. So can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, your upcoming book and, uh, and what that's, when it, when is, what's coming with that? Uh, well, so what in this book is what it is, is it's kind of a, uh, it's actually a little bit of a spur of the moment. This is something that my uh, publisher didn't want me to say, but I actually wrote it on a flight uh, to, to Asia, right? So I wrote it in the course of about 12 hours. And uh, what it is, is it's a, it's a complete download of its uh, much deeper click on the science that is going in the essential oil space. We look at the science uh, of looking very deep at the science of essential oils with respect to cells and to genes and so forth and the impact that that is having and the science that has brought uh, a lot of what uh, we see today. Uh, and so it's, a, it's very much a deep download of what we can see. It shows its relation of how ultimately these molecules in which we're consuming are a portion of what make us us, right? And, we, and I line that out where you can see the importance of eating pure proteins and amino acids and eating that healthy nutrition that is often found in marine and how that can ultimately lead and how those comprise ultimately us as a human being as a whole, and how it's so important to get those pure uh, components. And so I, I speak on those, I speak ultimately about uh, genes and the impact that that has uh, in these types of experiments that have been done. I touch a little bit on that telomere data that I, I talked about earlier. Uh, I talked about the AGX zones. I talk a lot about uh, what uh, the cell is and why it is so important that a lot of the science that we look at is looking at that cell with the basic unit of life. Uh, and so, uh, it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful journey of tapping into Dr. Plant's head, I guess, for a while, and uh, 
uh, it's, it might be a scary ride, but uh, I was able to uh, publish or publish that book and co-author it with uh, Scott Johnson. He's a renowned uh, doctor in the essential oil space, so it was a privilege to work with him. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, and you know, when when you put all this stuff together around the essential oils, to me, it's it's what's been most interesting with my own personal journey is that it's it's changed aspects of my life that have nothing to do with health. You know, like when you start taking the essential oils and getting your health on point, it's changed areas of my life, ways that of operation, it's changed my kindness. You know, like it, it's, it's affected me in ways that I just want to share it with everyone. That's why I'm so passionate about this. So I'm really glad that you're sharing kind of the science behind how all this works in the mind, in the body, so that people can better understand how it impacts them. Because I think a lot of people are impacted greatly by Moringa and the essential oils and they don't understand it. And some of them don't care to understand it. And some of them, like me, want to dork it out with the science. So I'm so glad you got a book coming out. Yeah. So uh, you can, uh, I think it's available on Amazon. Just type in Synergy. It's an essential oil thing is the name of the book. Uh, it's in soft copy as well as on Kindle version. So. Oh, so it's available now? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, great. That's awesome news. So Synergy. Okay, great. It's an essential oil thing. Okay, got it. Um, and what can you share with us about the movie that's coming out? So this is uh, Ken's movie. You know, if you ever had the opportunity to meet Ken Brailsford, he's the founder wow. of International. He's, uh, he's as eclectic as an individual as you'll ever meet. He is, is inspired about what nature has to offer. That's why he's the grandfather of the uh, natural supplementation industry. Uh, but he's also eclectic in his passions. One of his passions that he never really talks about is actually a, a passion for the arts and movies. Uh, and so he uh, he wanted to put together the script. He's a very spiritual man, and he wanted to bring a little bit of uh, spirituality and uh, understanding the relations of human interaction uh, in this complex world we live in. And even though we are all different in our personalities and our interests, we all connect on a spiritual level. And, and so that movie is called uh, Christmas Eve, and it's uh, coming out uh shortly i don't know exactly when the premiere is happening december 4th december 4th yes it's happening in hollywood december 4th um and so there are also going to be a few lucky people that are able to attend uh the premiere of that movie uh, so for those that are registered for the 2016 convention he's going to draw a few names out of those people uh, i think by sunday or thereabouts yeah. I'm going to draw right today. Down, and they are invited to the premiere of that movie. And so it's, uh, I've had the opportunity to see it. I absolutely love it. Uh, and uh, it's a movie that just kind of leads you to think of how important, even though you feel like you might be a small piece in this world, of just how important you are uh, as we are all connected spiritually. Excellent. Okay, great. I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize the scope of it. I just heard that there was a movie coming out. So I know we're starting to run out of time. So um, there's just a couple other quick things. Um, while we're still kind of on the Moringa subject, uh, I get the question a lot, like what, what, how and why is our Moringa different? You know, I'd, I'd love to, for you to speak a little bit about the shade drying versus the sun drying, including the different aspects other than the leaf, which it seems, it seems most competitors are just playing with the leaf. Um, yeah. So what are the benefits of playing with more than the leaf? And can you speak a little bit about shade drying versus sun drying? Absolutely. So I, actually, I, I touch on there's five key components that make our Moringa different. One is we uh, have analyzed farms from across the globe, and we have identified the most nutritious location of growing Moringa. Work has been done that shows, depending on where Moringa grows, it differs widely in its nutritional value. So that's the first thing. We have isolated uh, and, and uh, securitized farms in that very nutritious location of growing Moringa oleifera. The second component, just as you said, is we utilize the different parts of the tree. Moringa itself is what is, delivers the nutrition, not just the leaves, but it's the seeds and the fruit as well. So at ZG International, to maximize the nutritional potential of Moringa oleifera, we use all three components together, the leaf, the seed, and the fruit. Uh, and then the third component is, is we shade dry our Moringa leaves. Trees of Life Research has done wonderful uh, studies on this showing that when you shade dry the Moringa leaves, rather than leaving them in the sun, you get significantly better enrichment, bioavailability, and preservation of those nutrients. We do just that. Uh, it's much more of a costly, time-consuming uh, process, but it's something that we ultimately take the pledge to do to ensure that our product is always at the highest standard. Uh, the fourth thing that we have done is we have implemented a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility to make sure that our Moringa is not adulterated during the delicate manufacturing process. Um, 
literally tens of millions of dollars have gone into this facility to make sure that our Moringa is up at the highest standard. And then the fifth component is we have instituted a quality control system that allows us to check for pesticides, heavy metals, and a variety of other potential contaminants, as well as validating the nutritional value of that Moringa oleifera. Um, and that is done before a product is ever made, as well as once the finished product is completed. And so we take a huge scope of making sure that our Moringa is absolutely uh, the best that the market has to offer. Awesome. And I, I just want to uh, mention quickly that you know, whether it be we're talking about Moringa or the essential oils, temperature is a key component when doing the extraction because of the enzymes, right? So like when you're putting things in the sun, you're damaging enzymes. It's the same as a lot of essential oil companies out there that are less than wonderful, uh, just use too, so, such a high temperature that they're damaging precious enzymes. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, we, yeah, when we distill, we look at this individually, and this is again kind of speaks to the importance of a clinical standard, is we want to match our chemical constituents to those that have been used in standards. And so we, for example, the citrus oils are cold pressed, making sure that many of those constituents that can easily be uh, uh, damaged or absent in steam distillation, those aren't done so. So we'll cold press the citrus. Uh, using a steam distillation in a low pressure atmosphere allows us to make sure that we are not using extensive heat during that distillation process, allowing us to, uh, to make sure that our essential oils continually and consistently align with that clinical grade standard we've established. Excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so I'm going to get to questions, and I know we're I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to make this really quick. It's going to be like short answer, but and I want to mention first that um, I want to mention first that there were quite a few questions um, on the Facebook group that mentioned diagnosis. Not only can I not ask those to Dr. Plan, I deleted them just to make sure everyone's clear that we can't really mention diagnosis because. The FDA um, is being very uh, clear that um, we cannot connect that. So what we talk about is inflammation. We can talk about anti-inflammatories. We can talk about antivirals. We can talk about the zones of the body. Um, but to mention diagnosis, that's something different. That's what, you know, that's doctors and doctors have come up with these diagnoses. And so we stay far away from those. So if you saw your comment or your question got deleted, that's why. And we just, we want to make clear that we're helping with nutrition and, and we want to be very clear on what we can speak about and what we can speak about as the zones of health. Um, we can speak about what has, you know, properties in terms of those things I mentioned. So yeah. just to so be clear, clear that that's why I remember. Yeah, one exception I want to put out. Uh, we, it's also uh, not uh, in our best interest as well to be speaking about antivirals right? Those, or antibacterials. Those in essence are looked at as something that also can be uh, looked at as a prescription if, oh, you have a viral infection, this is what you take, or you have a bacterial infection, this is what you should do. Uh, those are also words that we have to stay away from. So the zones, you are absolutely correct. And the reason is, is the FDA has clearly delineated itself in saying the supplement industry is not FDA. Uh, or the statements by what the supplement industry does are not validated by the FDA. And what does that really mean? Well, a drug company will spend billions of dollars of ultimately doing a clinical study so that they can ultimately say the phrase helps cure or helps lessen the symptoms of or whatever they do. And they will spend billions of dollars of those studies to ultimately get the FDA to allow them to say a particular language, right? That's why that language at the end of those pharmaceutical commercials are so carefully crafted is because ultimately there was a billion dollars of convincing and studying and so forth to allow them to say that. Now with the supplement, we fall more into, even though we're a supplement category, we kind of fall into the no man's land between food and medicine. And we see a lot of people that see the benefits of natural supplementation and want to ultimately have us fall into that medicine category. But a lot of the regulatories that we have may fall into the food category. So we're kind of that uh, uh, forgotten child, if you will, with respect to regulation. Um, and so when this happens, we are able to move very quickly. We're not having to do 10 years of clinical studies to ultimately validate the efficacy of our products and spend billions of dollars to get these natural products that are so wonderful out to the masses. But that also comes with that giant asterisk, is that we are then not able to ultimately say, uh, you know, cures or treats or lessen symptoms and those types of things. Uh, and so that's why the FDA is so uh, sensitive to those types of words is because 
uh, well, one, companies have spent billions of dollars to say those words, and, and two, uh, they want to make sure that those words are utilized in a proper way, that they continue to have merit and value. And there's a lot of companies out there that aren't doing the type of standards that we are, that will readily use those words and where it ultimately diminishes the value of those words and it lessens the integrity of the whole industry as a whole. Okay, got it. Yeah, and I'm learning something here. I actually learned to use those words in a compli FDA compliance class, but it wasn't through Zija, so I'm learning something today and I appreciate you uh, setting me straight on that. Um, we all, I think everyone that decides to do this as a form of income needs to continue to look at, you know, what is compliant because you really don't want to spend years and years of your life creating a wonderful retirement plan for your family and then lose it because you said the wrong thing or didn't yeah. understand compliance and whatnot. So it's very important. And I apologize for... No, yeah, no. It's, and this is what this, I love about these, right? It's an opportunity for us to all learn. And, uh, you know, and a lot of us at the compliance thing, Jason Allman is a great educator for helping people do that, just that. And when we learn how we can ultimately speak, it allows us to move that much more confidently and fastly in growing our business. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a great tool that we have to where, if, you know, if I know exactly what I can say, I can shout that as loud as I can. I can put it in as many social media places as I can. I don't need to, I don't need to all of a sudden speak in Morse code. And that allows us to actually move and grow that much quickly in our business. Okay, great. So we're going to wrap it up here. I have one quick question that was a compliant question. Uh, can, you know, this comes from someone that uh, I put on a toxic cleanse. Uh, and she's asking, how long can she take the XM, AM, and PM? Is this something you can take forever? Or is it something like, and, and can you answer that for all of the, the Zija products? You know, people think, oh, I'm going to get on this 30-day cleanse. But it's not just about a 30-day cleanse. It's more of a long-term approach. So can you speak to what should be taken while getting to your ideal weight, um, while cleansing, and then what should be taken long-term? Yeah, so I, I look at it ultimately, if we're looking to get to our ideal weight, I absolutely am not a fan of diets. Um, I believe ultimately that you should live your life to where you will constantly uh, uh, migrate towards your ideal weight and that same behavior will keep you at that ideal weight. Um, this idea of having one type of lifestyle to get to a certain weight and then ultimately changing that lifestyle once you're at your ideal weight uh, never makes sense. Ultimately, what you want to do is incorporate a lifestyle that gradually gets you to your ideal weight and then allows you to maintain that lifestyle to live to be at that weight. And so I'm a firm believer and we are needing, all of us are needing help with respect to controlling our appetite. And that's mainly because the amount of advertising and uh, media and the engineering of food to be more addictive, we need to ultimately put uh, some uh, ammo in our field to help combat the oppressive behavior we're being uh, exposed to by the food industry. Uh, second is I believe we all need nutrition. So we all need to find our appetite suppressant, which can be an XM burn, XM AM, or XM PM, depending on your level of stimulation that is suitable for you. Take those uh, to help you throughout the day. Your nutrition, Supermix, Smart Mix, or XM Plus, get the nutrition you need because so often our food is absolutely robbed of those key nutrients. And then the third is take the premium tea. I usually recommend about once to three times a week on that uh, Zija premium tea to help detoxify. And this is primarily a colon detoxification with the premium Correct. tea. Correct, yep. So, um, okay, I think this is going to be the second to last question. So the X and burn has changed and I was on a conference call the other night. I, I didn't unfortunately make it to um, Salt Lake City. But there was, there's something, that the, the question that came up was how's the X and burn changed? And I heard in the conference call something about Moringite. Moringite, yeah. Can you spell that for me? M-O-R-I-N-G-I-N-E. Okay, got it. And so what this is, is this compound has been studied for years. Um, and it was initially identified in Moringa, but it's also found in celery and apples. And what this is, is it's a powerful appetite suppressant. It's been studied in its powers with that. And it's actually called moringine because it's so heavily found in moringa. Uh, and so uh, we were able to isolate this. We're the first market. We have a patent pending formula on this. Um, and then in the fast evolving world of supplementation, this just shows you how prepared Zija International is. Understanding that it's an evolving market, we have been years in preparation for this formula. Uh, this, we filed a patent for this clear back in 2014. 
uh, this formula that is coming, and it is absolutely, uh, the distributor force is absolutely loving this product. Uh, everything that I see everywhere is the wonderful power that it's giving, helping people overcome their, their midday hunger, as, as well as giving them the energy to sustain throughout the day. Nice. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people when they hear appetite suppression, they're like, oh, wait a second, there's diet pills, they, you know, they have appetite suppression and diet pills. First off, that's usually synthetics and chemicals that are not natural. And second off, when we're giving the body all these beautiful things that it needs, the body doesn't have the appetite that it would. Like when we are um, already nutrient deficient, like most of us are, and then we go on a diet and cut calories, now our body, our cells are screaming, feed me, feed me, feed me. And when you get onto the Moringa, it's the opposite. The cells finally have what they desire. The cells finally have the nutrients they've been wanting and, and waiting for. And so they tell the brain, hey, I'm good. You know, I, you don't need to feed me three huge meals per day that could feed a family in most countries. I'm okay. You know, you can stop feeding me because it's the empty calories that have had us eating so much and still being hungry. Absolutely. And that's, that's what I talked about with food being engineered the way it is, is food will absolutely be engineered to remove those nutrients because a lot of times it's nutrients that send the satiating signals to our brain, right? Our body is craving nutrients so that it can convert food into energy. That's the key purpose of nutrients. And so we can eat tons and tons of calories, but we'll still feel tired and we'll still feel hungry. And the reason that is is because that reaction of converting all of that food into energy can't go forward because it's nutritionally we're still starved. And so that's the power. And when we say appetite suppression, I believe the real word for it is, is we are ultimately allowing our stomach and our mind to communicate better. We're allowing our real balance of the caloric need we're needing to, to be uh, more effectively felt. Yeah, so the way I like to say it is we finally get our bodies to, into a nutrient efficiency instead of nutrient deficiency. Perfect. And then when you're there, you're, you're not starving all the time, so you're not having to eat all these, you know, all these meals. Um, okay, so the last question today is going to be, what question have you been waiting someone to ask you in an interview that just hasn't, hasn't come up yet? You know what? This is where I need to give a shout out to um, to uh, ask me what the key to my success has been. Right on. Yeah. So yeah. So this is going to be is absolutely. And this is a shout out to my wife and kids. Um, I can tell you by nice. every 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 good man out there is a much better woman. Um, and uh, you know, I grew up. I'm a first generation college student, and uh, she inspired me to live my dream of pursuing science. And, uh, you know, this is a, I want everyone out there to realize you can accomplish so much more than you think yourself you can do. Uh, a lot of times we need to believe in what others see us as rather than what we see ourselves as. And uh, my wife saw so much more in me than I saw growing up in a small trailer in a small town. Uh, the idea of being a Harvard-educated scientist seemed absolutely uh, preposterous. And so uh, uh, she inspired me, and she is the key to my success. And I really believe her only uh, her only weakness is poor taste in men, but uh, luckily I've been able to capitalize <laughs> off that weakness. Nice, that's awesome. Yeah, and I mean a lot of people talk about how you're changing the world and, and of nutrition, and you're changing the game, and your brain is so important to this movement. But without her love, that your brain would have still been there, but it wouldn't have been put to use in this way. So I yeah. was stocking shelves at Target at the time. So. <laughs> That's incredible. So Great. Dr. Plant, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know this isn't something you're able to do often. And uh, thank you, Joel McNinch, for uh, helping to make this happen. And Tommy Chop, of course, Zach Nassar. Um, I want to say uh, keep doing what you're doing. You know, I'll follow you wherever you take us. If you start telling us, you know, we need to do different things, I'm going to always take that with an open mind and say Dr. Plant has my best interest at heart. And it really means a lot to me that someone smarter than me in this field is looking out for us like this. Well, I really sometimes, yeah, the smartest people are the ones that realize there's smarter people out there. So thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. Right. And, uh, I look up to you guys as well. You guys are an inspiration to me. So uh, uh, this is the year of Zija. Uh, let's get 10,000 uh, next year in Salt Lake City, 10,000 at our 10-year reunion. Thanks again, Joe. It's been a wonderful opportunity. Yep. All right. Namaste, y'all. Thanks for joining us. Peace. Thanks, Dr. Plant.